Two tea breaks this morning. Perfect. Thanks. I'm looking forward to it. Second lecture this morning by Ellen Tribal. Uh, so we got down, I think, what, 200 nanometers yesterday, the last talk. So now we're going to go 30 orders of magnitude larger. <laughs> okay. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Uh, please tell me if this becomes a problem. Um, we're all cooped up in here with our own aerosols. So um, if you have a question, which I strongly encourage, um, you know, please ask it loudly and distinctly so I can answer the question that you actually asked or try to do that. So I want to um, slightly amend the way uh, Steve Tobias uh, generously characterized my talk. Um, I am going to be talking about hydrodynamics at the largest scales, but the theme is that we cannot do that without a proper understanding of the kinetic scales. So we're actually going to spend most of the time lurking down at the kinetic scales uh, rather than the, the cosmic scales. However, the kinetic scales uh, that we'll be talking about are really uh, kind of representative of solar system scales, a fraction of an astronomical unit. So even though that's eight or nine orders of magnitude below the scales where we eventually wind up, I think it may be uh, still uh, has pride of place among the scales that we've considered so far uh, in this school. Okay, so the situation that I want to focus on is illustrated in this um, kind of flawed sketch here. Um, this is the distribution function in energy. So a number of particles uh, per energy is a function of energy for uh, the, in, the diffuse interstellar gas in our galaxy. And we could draw a similar diagram for other diffuse astrophysical gases like the, the gas between galaxies and also to some extent the heliosphere uh, of our own solar system. So it's a nice Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution with a kind of mean energy around one electron volt, which is about 10 to the four Kelvin. But then there's this tail here, uh, which exists in complete defiance of thermodynamics. So from a thermodynamic point of view, it should not be here. And although the number uh, or the number density of particles in this scale is trivial, somewhere between 10 to the minus nine and 10 to the minus 10 of these particles, they have about as much energy as that thermal gas combined. So the question is, um, do these high energy particles, which we're gonna call cosmic rays, do they just kind of slip like ghosts without interacting in any important way with the thermal gas? Um, or do they somehow contrive to share energy and momentum with the thermal gas, even though they're completely collisionless? And what I'll show you is that because these diffuse gases are also pervaded by a magnetic field, both an average magnetic field and a fluctuating magnetic field, uh, there's a strong coupling between the thermal gas and the cosmic rays exchange of energy and momentum. So what we're gonna to try to get through today is I'm gonna show you a few slides on the so-called feedback problem and on cosmic rays. And here, you know, I feel like I'm kind of walking a fine line uh, because I think there are very few people in this room who've chosen to study astrophysics. So I don't want to burden you with a lot of extra phenomenology, but I also don't want to uh, go completely without the motivation for the work that we're doing, because otherwise I think it'll look a little bit sterile. So I'll show you some slides and then we'll kind of start off gently by doing what we're ultimately going to do for cosmic rays with photons, just ordinary radiation, no magnetic field, no plasma effects, just make a few points that way. Then I'll show you how we can solve two thirds of the thermal uh, cosmic ray problem uh, fairly easily. We'll go through that. I'll also say a little bit more about the magnetohydrodynamic approximation that Steve introduced. I'll, I'll go a little bit into the kind of the domain of validity of that approximation. And then uh, we'll spend uh, a bit more time on getting the other third of the coupling. And this will lead to something called the Parker transport equation. So 
Uh, this was something that Gene Parker wrote down in the mid 1960s. I think it was published in 1965. Uh, Parker passed away um, earlier this year at the age of 94. And uh, then after the Parker transport equation and the fluid model that comes from it, which we can then uh, couple to a fluid description of the gas, we'll talk about another transport equation, which is based on a sort of self-regulation of cosmic ray behavior through kinetic instabilities. And that leads to a different transport equation and a different set of fluid equations. And I think by this time we'll be on day three, I'll show you that which of these models you use actually makes a difference in how the system evolves and what we would predict. And so it's really important to get it right. So that's kind of in a nutshell, what I hope to do in these three lectures. Okay. So, so what is feedback? So feedback in the astrophysical context is the idea that, that both accretion onto supermassive black holes and star formation are self-regulating in some way. And this inherently limits their efficiency. So um, these slides are gonna show a little bit of feedback, then a little bit of cosmic rays, I'd like to begin, let's see, where should I point? Should I use my cursor here? Is that the best thing? Or this thing? Okay, that's right, because we're just on the camera. Okay, so I'd like to acknowledge um, the wonderful people I've had the privilege of working with. So Chad, Rourke, and Evan are uh, former or current students. Um, Peng and Mateusz and Karen are, are my peers, they're faculty. Josh is a former postdoc, and Sherry is, is an undergrad, uh, figuring out her place in the universe, I guess, in some way we all are. Okay, so let's begin with supermassive black hole feedback. So this is, uh, so NASA has helpfully uh, put in the scale here. So this is 250,000 light years. And this structure here is imaged in X-rays. Uh, this bright spot here is a galaxy. And this galaxy has a supermassive black hole, which is accreting material. And some fraction of the accretion energy, the gravitational potential energy released by the accretion process is somehow creating um, immense bubbles of relativistic plasma which are expanding through the galaxy and into the surrounding medium and launching uh, what seem to be waves that then propagate throughout this cluster of galaxies and dissipate and heat the, and heat the cluster. We don't understand a lot of how this works. So we think that every massive galaxy has a supermassive black hole, by which I mean a black hole of a million solar masses or more um, in its nucleus, but they're only accreting about 1% of the time. And so what, why, why 1%? Is it some ex extrinsic phenomenon or is there some self-regulation? Well, we think in the case of galaxy clusters, so, there's a, there's a medium here filled with gas that doesn't show on the medium. Uh, it gets heated, it stays where it is, but eventually it cools. The, the source of accretion is shut off. The gas cools uh, and, it, and then once it cools, it falls in into the gravitational potential well, creates a new episode of activity, heats again. So there are many things we don't understand about supernova black hole feedback or sorry, supermassive black hole feedback, but this seems to be roughly how it works. There's also feedback on galaxy scales, probably driven by episodes of star formation. This is just an image of an outflow, uh, both very hot gas shown in red, emitting in X-rays and cooler ionized gas emitting in H alpha, uh, which is the two to one transition, electronic transition of the hydrogen atom. Uh, and you can see that here's the, the galaxy itself, the core of the galaxy. And there's this outflow uh, driven by 
stellar mechanical and radiative luminosity and supernova explosion energy. And these outflows are, are very common in galaxies and they enrich the intergalactic medium with metals, the products of stellar nucleosynthesis. We can get down to a smaller scale. Uh, you probably have seen this image since it's been plastered over every medium that I'm aware of. This is one of the images recently released by NASA for the uh, result of the James Webb Space Telescope observations. So this is an example of stellar feedback. So up here in blue, pay no attention to the colors. They're not the real colors. Up here in blue is hot gas heated by stars that have formed uh, here, here, and somewhere up here. And they're creating a high pressure cavity, uh, which is bounded by this much cooler gas in which star formation is also occurring. And whether the net effect of this is to promote star formation or to suppress it, either so which wins, the compression and gravitational collapse or the heating and evaporation, um, is something that we still don't understand very well, but we know that the Milky Way contains about uh, 10 to the nine solar masses of gravitationally unstable gas. The characteristic collapse time of that gas is about 10 million years. So if you divide the mass by the time, uh, you might estimate that there's a hundred solar masses of new stars being formed every year in the Milky Way. However, we can actually measure that number and it's more like two to three solar masses in new stars being formed. So something, probably stellar energy sources themselves are reducing the efficiency of star formation. Okay, so that, so what are the agents of, of feedback? Uh, how you know how do things like stars and um, supermassive black holes um, limit their own environments or regulate their own environments? So the three most commonly mentioned agents of feedback are one, just hot gas. So if you heat gas above the escape temperature from the galaxy, it'll come boiling out. Um, that's one. Radiation. So radiation pressure can expel gas and cosmic rays. And cosmic rays um, are sort of the dark horse in this, uh, in this race for feedback, whether it's a competition or cooperation. Uh, so they were sort of the latest, the last to be studied. We know the less about them, the least about them. And for now, at least, they seem very promising. OK, so now I'm going to show you a little bit about cosmic rays. So first of all, um, this image does uh, has a dual role. It, these little black line segments are the orientation of the magnetic field in the galaxy revealed by the polarization of synchrotron radiation that's produced by cosmic ray electrons, relativistic electrons, gyrating in the magnetic field of the galaxy. So you can see that there's a pervasive and pretty well-ordered magnetic field in this galaxy and there are cosmic ray electrons and we can measure remotely uh, cosmic ray nuclei uh, from their gamma ray emissions. So every, um, on the average 100 million years or so, a cosmic ray nucleus will collide with an interstellar atom, uh, produce pi mesons, which are very unstable and some fraction of those pi mesons will decay into gamma rays. And these gamma rays can be detected. Uh, and here they're sort of following um, denser than average gas, which has more collisions and emits uh, more strongly. So is the magnetic field being dragged along by the plasma flow there? That so I think that the, that the overwhelming sort of toroidal shape here is a reflection of the fact that the main dynamics in this galaxy is rotation. So good, good call. Um, if we looked on smaller scales, which actually this group has done, we would see an irregular component that represents um, turbulent dragging and possibly turbulent amplification of the kind that Steve uh, Tobias talked about. Okay, uh, so 
Here, here are a few little facts about cosmic rays. They're about 10 to the nine or 10 to the minus 10 by number, same energy density. And about 10% of the power that's released by supernovae uh, has to go into cosmic rays to keep the cosmic ray population in a galaxy like the Milky Way in a steady state. I'll say more about that. Okay, so here's the cosmic ray energy spectrum. I don't know if you can, can you read these numbers here in the back? No, okay. So this energy scale is in electron volts. Um, the rest mass of a proton is about one giga electron volt, 10 to the nine electron volts up here. This goes from 10 to the eight to 10 to the 22, okay? So it's a vast energy range. One of the reasons I like this slide is that here is a list of the experiments that went into compiling this spectrum. So vast variety of experiments. And um, so to lowest order, uh, you know, this is a pretty good power law over these many orders of magnitude, but cosmic ray physicists um, get very excited about small features like this so-called knee, it is so-called ankle that seem to represent uh, some new acceleration process or new propagation process or new loss process taking over. We are gonna mostly be concerned with the cosmic rays here at a few to 10 giga electron volts. We're gonna idealize them as being fully uh, relativistic moving at the speed of light. And we're gonna do that because you can account for most of the energy density and most of the pressure uh, here in this band. So these ultra high energy cosmic rays uh, are extremely interesting, mysterious. They probably have an extra galactic origin, but we're really not gonna talk about them. Here's a little more, a uh, few more quantitative uh, facts. So the cosmic rays are mostly protons. Uh, electrons are down by a uh, factor of 50 to 100. The energy density in cosmic rays in the Milky Way is about one EV per cubic centimeter, which is a rough equipartition with the other forms of energy. Uh, the number density here is very low, and the average energy is about three giga electron volts. Okay, what else do we know? Well, we know a lot. We can measure their composition at the Earth. And uh, this, there's actually quite a lot of um, information locked up in here, some of which was very surprising to people. So the main uh, thing that you could glean, uh, so this is abundance uh, by, by element up to uh, an atomic number of 40. The solar system abundances, which are kind of representative of the galaxy and the galactic cosmic ray abundances over most of this plot are, are very similar. What this tells us is that the source of cosmic ray material is not exotic. It's not the core of a supernova, which would you know, cause for, call for an enormous enrichment in the iron peak elements. Um, there's some, but actually not as much as if, if it were pure supernova ejecta. It's pretty consistent with interstellar composition with one exception, uh, namely the light elements where lithium, beryllium, and boron, where the cosmic rays are tremendously enriched. And these, this enrichment is interpreted as the result of spallation of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, cosmic ray nuclei, hitting interstellar atoms. So from the abundances of these very low Z elements, uh, we can infer how much material cosmic rays have passed through in the galaxy on their way to us and how long they've been confined. And basically they, what this says is that the average cosmic ray that we detect at the earth uh, has been around for about 20 million years. Now the light travel time across the Milky Way is uh, if you go out through thin galactic disk, uh, it's a few thousand years. And if you go out the long way, it's a few thousands of years. So cosmic rays are very effectively trapped in the Milky Way. They're, they're not just made and go streaming out. And what traps them is the magnetic field. Okay, so that's another thing we know. 
And yes, please. Yes. So, um, so there are different. Uh, so some of them do make it down to the surface of the Earth, and uh, you can, you know, if you have a bubble chamber or uh, certain types of plastic, you know, you can actually. I have pictures of tracks that these various nuclei leave, but there are also. Um, so you don't have to filter through the atmosphere. There are also space experiments that directly affect uh, detect cosmic rays. And then the most energetic cosmic rays break up in the atmosphere and produce these air showers of, uh, there's Cherenkov, there are muons, there are neutrinos, and there are these large detectors that are spread out over many square kilometers that put together the ultra high energy cosmic rays. So yeah, so actually remote sensing of cosmic ray nuclei is fairly new. It had to await gamma ray astronomy. Good question. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. And actually, the um, the flux of cosmic rays at the highest energies is, is insufficient to measure the light element abundances. This is more representative of the, the GEV population, which fortunately is what concerns us here. But yeah, good, good observation. Any other? OK. So the third thing that's going to be very important for what we do is that cosmic rays are, are very isotropic. They're not coming in from preferred directions. Um, so we can only measure the anisotropy reliably uh, at uh, teravolt energies and above. And that's because the lower energy cosmic rays uh, are very strongly modulated by the magnetic field in the heliosphere. And you can, we know that because it goes up and down with the solar cycle, but completely subtracting uh, the, the heliospheric uh, influence is pretty much impossible. Measuring these tiny anisotropies, again, this represents one tenth of 1%. Okay, so cosmic rays are really very isotropic, uh, very small of order 10 to the minus five, Anisotropies have been detected, and there's kind of an interesting theoretical exercise what they are, but we don't really have to worry about that here. We also know that the Milky Way is not special. Uh, there's a very strong correlation between uh, cosmic ray energy density and star formation uh, across galaxies over a huge range of luminosities, uh, 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 12 solar luminosities. The Milky Way is about over here. Uh, and this is this is called the far infrared radio correlation. I won't bother to explain it, but it seems to be ubiquitous in a very large sample of galaxies. The Milky Way is not special. So, if we draw all these things together, what we're going to need uh, to develop the theory is this. Okay, so cosmic rays are accelerated from the interstellar medium in a events that produce roughly an e to the minus two spectrum that is then steepened by loss processes. Uh, they're confined to the Milky Way uh, for about 20 million years. And the confinement time and the high degree of isotropy can be explained if their, if their propagation uh, involves a lot of scattering off of something. Uh, and the scattering mean free path it's about one parsec. A parsec is about three light years. Um, about 10% of the non-neutrino energy in supernova explosions is required to keep the cosmic ray population in a steady state. And the Milky Way is not special. It's just an endemic phenomenon in galaxies, uh, galaxies in which stars are forming. Okay, so that is, uh, that's the astrophysical background and motivation. Any questions about the, about any of this? Okay, then um, let's ha let's say that's it for the slides. Uh, so I'm going to disconnect this, and um, if you wouldn't mind uh, raising that screen, uh, or do I do it? Um, okay.
Okay. So our first is understanding how cosmic rays is coupled thermal gas is, as I said, it's going to be considering photons. So let's consider the following situation. Um, we have some central source with some luminosity L, the dimensions of L or energy per time. So there's some radiation and there's some system here with a characteristic size R. And the radiative flux, the energy flux, and is of order uh, L over four pi R squared. So this is energy per area per time. And so this is energy. And there's a momentum flux. So which is just L over four pi R squared C. So this is momentum per area per time. Okay. So if one little lonely electron somewhere in this, uh, in this system, and it has a cross section, to radiation for an electron would be the Thompson cross section, uh, sigma. So this sigma is the cross section. The force on one electron is, uh, well, this is the momentum per area per time. So we'll just multiply by the area, namely the cross section. So it's L sigma over four pi R squared C. So the electron will uh, experience this radiative force uh, place when it's placed in this situation. Okay, um, notice that it depends, the force depends on how far you are from the source as an inverse square law. So if this source also has mass, there's an inward force that is also, also goes as one over R squared. And so if the gravitational force is less than the radiative force, uh, then the electron will fall in. Otherwise it'll be expelled. And the critical luminosity, which divides the infall situation from the outflow situation is called the Eddington limit. You may have heard of it. It's very important in astronomy for a one solar mass source, 10 to the five solar luminosities. So the sun is safely within its Eddington limit. Okay, but now what if you put not one electron here, but a whole lot? So would you eventually um, run out of photons? So if we, can we just scale this argument up to an arbitrarily large number of electrons? Well, let's see how that would work by considering just the opposite limit, which we can call the uh, diffusive limit. So let's assume that the mean free path which is one over the number density of electrons times their cross section is much less than the radius of the system R. So this is where you put so many electrons in that photons have an overwhelming probability of interacting on a much shorter scale than R. Okay, so in that case, uh, we can estimate the escape time using standard random walk arguments. And 
it's it's what? Uh, well, it's r squared over some diffusivity, and that diffusivity is of order the mean free path over the velocity of light. And um, well, let's put a three in here just to be um, rigorous. Okay, so here's our escape time. So the energy density is of order. Well, it's the energy input per time. So the luminosity times the escape r squared over lambda mean free path times c and then divided by the volume by r cubed times three. So now we have nine over four pi lambda L lambda mean free path times C times R. So the energy density, uh, the shorter the mean free path, the greater the energy density. So let's keep going. The radiation pressure is one third of the radiation energy density and the gradient of the radiation pressure, which is the force per volume is uh, one third is U rad over three R, which is three over four pi L over lambda mean free path C R squared. And now let's use what the mean free path is. It's one over N sigma. It's three L over four pi C R squared and sigma, which is N times the force on a single electron yeah ah excellent quite excellent excellent question so what i'm assuming here is that the photon loses very little energy uh upon scattering that's it yeah excellent so yeah um, so it depends on the process, but it in the end, there are situations where it doesn't matter too much. So for example, in the interstellar medium, ultraviolet radiation is heavily absorbed by interstellar dust. Okay, so what happens? So the dust heats up to a temperature at which the heating balances the radiation temperature. And so you no longer have an ultraviolet source, you have an infrared source but you still have a lot of radiative energy. But yes, that's in general, that's an excellent question. Okay, so in this, in this model, the, so we asked, if you keep adding electrons, are you gonna just snuff out uh, this, this outward force? And the answer is that you don't, you have just as much force in the diffusive limit you have just as much force on every electron as you did when there was just one electron to hog the whole radiation field. And that's because as you add more electrons, you, you let the energy density in radiation build up because it takes longer to get them out and they go in tandem. Okay, so this and other arguments, including it's about the radiative luminosity of stars, um, led to a lot of popularity of radiation-driven models of outflow. So you saw this outflow, X-ray, um, hydrogen alpha. Uh, could this be driven by the radiation pressure associated with all, this, um, all these photons? Well, um, the answer turned out to be no. 
And that's because radiation has this sneaky tendency to leak out through holes. So radiation is very, it is a, it's a very important source of pressure in, in objects that are basically round and solid like stars. But in objects that are full of holes or that have some large anisotropy in themselves like accretion disks, um, radiation is actually very good at getting out. And radiation doesn't have to be uh, a passenger on structure that already exists. Radiation can make its own structure by instabilities uh, caused by too large a fraction of the hydrostatic support is provided by radiation pressure. So a star that's almost entirely supported by radiation pressure is unstable and it will actually eject a certain amount of material. Okay, so, um, so for that reason, the, the bloom is sort of off the radiation pressure rose as, as a source of galactic feedback. So um, let's turn to hot gas. That was another popular one. So hot gas is great. Uh, it's hot, it has high pressure, but it cools. It cools radiatively and it cools adiabatically. And models of galactic winds that are driven entirely by radiation pressure um, have it fa generally fail to launch. The, ga the gas gets a certain way, certain distance out of the galaxy, then it cools and it falls back. It's, it's what's called the galactic fountain. So let's go to cosmic rays. Um, they, you know, as we saw, they represent only a few percent of stellar energy output, maybe 10%, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, but they don't cool uh, as fast as thermal gas because of their uh, equation of state and because of the, just the processes that are allowed to them. And they're tied, you know, the, the low gas, which creates holes for radiation to stream out of, and the hot gas, which is pretty opaque, are tied together by the stellar magnetic field that you saw in that example. So maybe cosmic rays are the answer. Maybe cosmic rays, uh, the pressure of cosmic rays can kind of drag everything out. Okay, so that motivates us to um, develop a, a model for cosmic ray, for cosmic rays as a fluid that can interact with the thermal gas. Um, any questions so far on where we're going or where we've been? Okay. So our goal for now is to incorporate cosmic rays into astrophysical magnetohydrodynamics. MHD. Okay, so let's begin by uh, a kind of quick and dirty derivation of MHD. So MHD at a glance. There's a lot of glancing in these lectures. Okay, so let's write down Force. So suppose we have some charge. Uh, so uh, let's. We're going to consider lots of different kinds of particles. So let's index its species by alpha. 
doesn't mean it's an alpha particle. And its charge is Q alpha. Okay, so, so how low down can I write and still, you can still see it? So can I write this low? Good, okay. Maybe this low, but no low. Okay. Oh, lift the board. Much better. Okay. Galileo is all we need. Um, okay. So the Lorentz force law says that dp by dt, it's called p alpha dt, is q alpha e, so the electric field part, plus its velocity, v alpha cross b over c. This is where the sort of the Gaussian CGS units uh, rear their ugly head. And uh, so here, okay, I'm, I'm an astrophysicist trained in the United States. Um, these are the only units I really feel comfortable with. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay, so there's, there's the force law. Holy cow. <laughs> well, boy, I'm having an easy time here. So this is actually my second summer school of the summer. Uh, I was in I was in Verana uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, for a summer school that was originally scheduled for 2020. Um, when I was invited, one of the inducements was that I would get to write on the same blackboard as Enrico Ferry. Uh, which probably would have disintegrated the first time I touched it. But uh, it turned out that over the two years of the pandemic, when the school was closed, uh, Fermi's blackboard disappeared. It was, you know, it was probably chopped into small pieces and sold in souvenir shops. But anyway, it was replaced by a couple of small whiteboards, which had a magnetic, had magnetic erasers of a kind I've never seen. You have to give this huge yank you free the eraser every time you want to erase the board. So this is, I, I don't aspire to Nigel's uh, fluidity with an eraser, but this is pretty easy. Okay, so now let's multiply by N alpha, which is the number of alpha particles per volume. So N alpha dP alpha dT is alpha E plus N alpha Q alpha V alpha cross B over C. Okay, um, this is typically called something. What is it called? It's the charge, yep, it's the charge density. Of species alpha. And N alpha Q alpha V alpha is also called something. It's current density. So this is the current density. And let's, let's give these things new symbols. Let's call them rho alpha and J alpha. Okay, so th this capital J is, is not the Jacobian or the Poisson bracket, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, it's current density. Okay. Measuring stat coulombs per square centimeter. <laughs> So E is 4.8 times 10 to the minus 10 electrostatic units. Uh,
That's all I know. Okay. So now let's sum over species. So the sum over alpha of uh, N alpha dP alpha dt is equal to rho q, I'll say in a minute what that is, E plus J cross B over C. So now we have the And now we have the total current density. Okay. So, and this is uh, the, so this is the momentum density So the electromagnetic terms are in some ways similar to what to, uh, Steve wrote down, but there's an important difference. What's that important difference? He got rid of the electric field and we haven't, but we will. So how do we do that? So at this point, we're going to talk about what is magnetohydrodynamics. What is MHD? So now we're going to do the MHD. And put an NR in front here. NRMHD approximation. And this NR stands for non relativistic. And you'll see in a moment where that comes in. Okay. So to begin with, uh, let's consider um, Faraday's law. So minus C curl of E, this is exact. And now we're going to introduce um, characteristic time scales and length scales. And we're gonna write this as V to indicate its magnitude divided by a time twiddles C magnitude of E over length, which we can easily manipulate to write as magnitude of E over the magnitude of B twiddles L over CT. And now we can introduce a characteristic velocity, which we'll call V. So we get V over C, and we're going to assume that it's much less than one. And this is why the NR qualifier comes in, because we're considering systems where the velocities, characteristic velocities are much less than the speed of light. Okay, so that is part of it. Uh, now let's consider um, Ampere's law. So 
So Ampere's law tells us that curl B is four pi J over C minus one over C DE DT. Um, we'll make the same dimensional arguments, uh, B over L twiddles uh, four pi over C. J uh, minus, doesn't matter if it's minus, E tilde over C, T tilde. Uh, let's compare B over L and E over C, T. So their ratio, E over C, T, B over L. Well, here's an L over T, that's a V. We already know that E over B is of order V over C. So this is V squared over C squared. So this term, is order V squared over C squared. And we can go back to what um, Steve called pre-Maxwell, which means that we drop the displacement current So we're going to drop the displacement current, and then we will have um, J over C is curl of B over four pi. Okay, so we can replace J by the curl of B in the force law, but we still haven't completely disposed of the um, electric field term. So let's now let's go to Poisson's equation. So Poisson's equation tells us that the divergence of E is uh, four pi rho Q, which we write as rho Q magnitude twiddles magnitude of E over four pi L. Okay, so now let's compare So now let's compare uh, rho Q E and J cross B over C. Okay, well, um, rho Q E over, so we know that J over C is like curl of B over four pi. So this becomes B squared. over four pi L. And so we have four pi uh, L over B squared. Rho Q was E over four pi L. And then we have another E. So the four pi L's cancel and we get magnitude of E squared over the magnitude of B squared which is order of D squared over C squared, much less than one. So why don't we just drop rho Q E? Okay, now don't let me do it without further discussion. 
there is a flaw in this argument. Radiation. Say what? Um, We're not thinking of actually radiated skin, much slower variation. Well, um, that's that's true, but that's beyond that's beyond anything I said. That's um, we're not putting. Yeah, I, I never thought it's a good idea. <laughs> However, that's the reason that uh, I have in mind is is a lot more primitive. Um, yeah. Um, so, and then if we, if we read that, but uh, if you discuss the interrogation of all, yeah. if you introduce the, the length scale L and the time scale B for the B scale and C scale, then you say that L over B is much less than the C the time. Yeah. Also, is that equivalent to say that the electric field varies in much longer scale? That's a um that is an excellent question and I will answer it when I do Ohm's law. So maybe I should have done Ohm's law first, but that's an excellent question. And actually your question is um sort of tied up with the with the answer to my question. So um so let's get back to my question. Class is overall neutral. Does that that um so that will again come into the the ohm's law but we didn't actually need to invoke quasi neutrality in um once we had poisson's equation we just saw that rho q is of order e over 4 pi l so if we accept that e over b is of order v over c we're there but we so we're going to have to be a little more careful consider ohm's law but but there is, just as the argument as I presented it, all works in two dimensions out of three. Because J cross B has no component parallel to B, right? However, whatever representation we have for J. So in the, in the directions transverse to B, this argument is solid, but what about, What about parallel to B? Okay. So now let's say a few things more about MHD, which um, some of you have actually already said. So to go further, we need a few more assumptions. And the assumptions that we need are that, and they can be justified a lot more rigorously um, than I was going to do them here. But if you have questions, please, please ask them. So MHD is a low frequency long length scale theory. So how low and how long? So what are some important scales? So So what are some important scales? Well, one important scale is the uh, Debye length. Any anyone know what the Debye length is, or how we how the Debye length maybe comes into a plasma problem? Yeah. Say what? Um. Do you say phonons? 
you're probably right, but I don't know enough about phonons uh, to up or down. However, I'm sure you're right. You obviously know something about phonons. Uh, yeah. It is a screening. It is a screening length in the sense that if you if you apply a voltage, if you have a tank of plasma and you uh, apply a voltage to it, uh, say at the walls, the electrons will rush over and screen out the resulting electric field over a scale of order length and the Debye length lambda D is something like seven centimeters times the temperature over the density to the one half in CGS units. So in astrophysical problems, it's really minuscule, okay? And this is the scale. So, so electrostatic fields are really only sustainable on scales less than lambda d. Well, how long can they be sustained? They can be sustained for a so-called plasma period. So there's this characteristic frequency, the plasma frequency on which um, a, a plasma supports electrostatic oscillations. And that is about how long you can sustain a parallel electric field. So one of the main assumptions of MHD, so we, we're going to assume that E parallel uh, is ignorable. And parallel here means parallel to C. Okay, so that is that is one example. And we're also going to assume, or what another sort of time scale, so low frequency is going to mean um, time scales much larger than the uh, ion gyro period. A uh, consequence of that is that electron and ion motions That the, e, that the E and the I flows VE equal to VI. Now it can't be exactly equal because if it were exactly equal, there would be no current. And we have to have a current to keep you know, the whole magnetic field picture going. So they're not exactly equal, but they're almost equal. And we're going to write this in uh, future notes as U. So basically the center of mass thermal gas velocity. Okay. So now let's write out our Oak's law. So Steve actually did this and Andy wrote down a sort of a fancier Ohm's law uh, yesterday. So Ohm's law is the is really the electron equation of motion. In uh in MHD, in MHD, we assume that the electromagnetic force in the frame of the fluid
is balanced by resistive drag. So that is about as simple as it gets. And what this says, therefore, is that E plus U cross V over C is J over sigma. And so we can write that in a form that leads to the induction equation. Holy cow. So, so I'm used to teaching 50 minute classes or sometimes 75 minute classes. Uh, 75 minute classes, I always give them a two minute break in between to you know get the kinks out. Uh, but I think I'm gonna switch all my classes to 90 minutes. <laughs> just see, uh, just see how that goes down. So, yeah. Uh, we have to think of E and B and J or as time dependent and spatially dependent or, because then I would, for example, have to consider sigma at finite frequencies or finite K. Yeah, good question, good question. So um, let's let's take sigma apart a little bit. So so in a sort of so a Coulomb collision So in general yes, E, B and J are time dependent, but I'm going to specifically answer your question with regard to sigma uh, because that's where a difference between what Andy presented and what we're going to assume here is going to show up. Okay, so Coulomb collision dominated uh, plasma. So sigma is uh, any e squared over me tau e and tau e is the collision time. And it's of order uh, 10 to the minus two, t to the three halves over n e. Uh, this is all Gaussian CGS units. And so in galaxies, uh, n e is about one and uh, t is about 10 to the four. So tau e, is about uh, 10 to the four seconds. And the conductivity turns out to be and the time scales for equilibrating the conduct balance kinetic acceleration and the deceleration due to drag is short. So the that he referred to important for high frequency waves. It's so important for HD. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and the tau e is collision time with what of what with what? Oh, it should be, uh, well, let's see. Uh, yeah, it should be up here. So this is, uh, this is Coulomb. So it's both electron ion and uh, electron electron scatter yeah so how does that electron 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 ion collision would be a holistic energy uh, energy momentum survey so why why it, but here you're saying that these collisions are lacking so they original direction so yeah, so if we, I mean, we could, I, I think that the, uh, this model of conductivity is called the Drude model. And uh, for example, it's an old uh, Jackson, it's an old edition of Jackson. I don't know if it's the new edition of Jackson. It's the Y edition of Jackson. Um, I could take a little time to derive it or, Yeah, 
Yeah. So I don't know if this is important. Um, the only context in which I've just uh, considered degenerate electrons is in stars, uh, both ordinary stars and neutron stars. And there, um, because of the high dege in, in degenerate situations, um, the scattering rate is, is much lower because you just have fewer allowed states that you can scatter into. I don't know if that's relevant uh, to what you said, but um, yeah, is it relevant? Okay, but good. <laughs> well, most of the... Yeah, um, yeah, we can, we can talk. You are treating ions and electrons as separate fluids or as one fluid? So, um, so the current, the, the electrons are just a lot more mobile. Um, the, the ions are, so if we work in the frame of the fluid, that's basically the frame of the ions. And the electrons um, are scattering from the ions. And because of the large mass difference, uh, there's relatively little energy transfer, but there is a directional scattering. Yes, enough enough to um, yeah we can we can estimate all these all these things. There are, I mean there are certainly plasma problems where um, the electron ion velocity difference is large, and the Hall effect. In, those are Hall plasmas, but those are scales. So in the interstellar medium, the um, the scale on which uh, Hall effects become important is a couple of hundred kilometers which again, you know, is extremely small compared to the phenomena we're gonna be discussing. But these are, um, your questions are great. And th this is part of the reason why I came here, you know, to see, you know, sort of how these effects play out in, in different fields. Okay, so, so we have our Ohm's law. So, um, so then E is minus U cross B over C uh, plus J over sigma. And if we go back to Faraday, it becomes an evolution equation for the magnetic field. Partial B, partial T is the curl of U cross B. So this is the inductive part. This is what we're going to call the magnetic diffusivity. And if eta is a constant, then we can write this as So this becomes um, eta minus eta 
dropped L squared B. So it looks like a magnetic diffusion equation. Okay. So now let's see what this means for cosmic rays. So, yeah, yeah. Would it change with spatially? Well, actually, I've only had to assume it's constant in space to take it out. But your question also applies to time. So um, the plasma conductivity, so remember, I wrote down sigma. I, I sort of botched it initially. But it depends on the on density, and it depends on the temperature. I guess the density dependence scales out. But it depends on temperature. So if temperature is a function of position, uh, then the diffusivity is a function of position, and you shouldn't necessarily pull it out of the derivative. That makes sense. Yeah. So actually, it's worse than that because in so we can define a magnetic Reynolds number. And this is the ratio of the uh, ohmic diffusion time over the dynamical time. And so the diffusion time would be something like L squared over eta, and the dynamical time would be something like L over U. So it's LU over eta, and in the if for galaxies, Rm uh, is globally, you know, it's something like 10 to the 21, okay? So you who study superconductivity, eat your hearts out. Galaxies are superconducting beyond the wildest dreams of any condensed matter physicist. And even in something like stars, the, this, this number. Uh, is they usually just drop resistive effects altogether. Now, this is, of course, very dangerous because, as you can see, uh, res the resistive effects, the magnetic diffusion term, is the highest order spatial derivative in the equation. And so what tends to happen is that there are thin layers or points where resistive effects are important. And then in the bulk of the domain, they're not so important. But for example, there could be no dynamos without resistive diffusion because it's, it's the resistivity that imparts some irreversibility to whatever amplification you get, um, among other things. So. Um, I am actually not going to be working with the diffusion term at all uh, in what we do, um, but you know, the, you know, you can't you can't do that all the time. Okay. Yeah. Other other questions. Okay. So so where are we on cosmic rays? Oh boy, we're really almost done here. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to cheat a little bit. The fluid equation that I derived didn't have pressure, didn't have the convective derivative in there, didn't have gravity, but we know that those things exist and we know how to put them in. So let's just put them back. So we have rho gas uh, 
DDT, uh, U gas plus U dot grad. U is minus the gas pressure gradient plus J in the gas cross B over C minus rho gas grad phi. This is the gravitational potential important at all these problems. So this is the thermal gas. Cosmic rays. So we should probably write down the same thing, but instead we're going to neglect their inertia. Because we've seen that their, their number density is just so low. So we're going to neglect their inertia and uh, by implication, uh, neglect uh, gravity. They're certainly, you know, they're moving at the speed of light. They could leave the galaxy immediately, if not for electromagnetic effects. And so we're just going to have on the left hand side, zero is minus grad P cosmic ray plus J cosmic ray cross B over C. Okay, uh, let's add them. So let's sum. over thermal gas of cosmic rays. So the left-hand side just has the gas, rho gas, partial U gas, partial T, plus U gas dot grad. U gas is minus the gradient. Now the combined pressures come in, P gas plus P cosmic ray plus combined Lorentz forces come in, J gas plus J cosmic ray cross B over C minus rho gas grad phi, J gas plus J cosmic ray is the total J in the system, which is curl B over four pi. Okay, so what are we left with? We're left with an equation for the gas in which the cosmic rays appear through their pressure gradient. And we have everything else. We have ordinary gas dynamics plus the cosmic gradient. So we are now two thirds of the way there. Why two thirds? Because we haven't dealt with the parallel component. If this equation were true everywhere, it would imply that the parallel component of the cosmic ray pressure is identically zero because there's no magnetic force to balance it. So it's got to be uniform. Uh, this is actually what uh, Gene Parker assumed in his discussion of an instability called Parker's instability, uh, which we'll be discussing later if we get there. So next time, which will be tomorrow, we'll, we'll start by considering the parallel dynamics carefully. This will take us into a discussion of scattering, a Fokker-Planck equation. We'll hack our way through it and we'll get there. Okay, so happy to take your questions.
having gone from this point yet, but if you ever care about the thermal phase at all, or are you assuming explicitly that the electron gas, electron part of the gas and the ionized part of the gas are in the same fixed element of temperature? Um, no, we're certainly not going to be assuming that. We're going to be, so the simplest, uh, we do need an equation, equation for pressure. Now, it turns out that the, uh, if you started with different electron and ion temperatures, the time scale on which they would equilibrate through Coulomb collisions would be very short. So we can treat the gas as a single fluid, but we can be as fancy as you like. We can assume adiabatic expansion. We can put in radiative cooling. We can put in heating. Uh, we're going to need parallel, uh, parallel equations for the cosmic rays, and those are going to be derived from kinetic theory, which we'll do next time. Good question. Professor, I have a question or a comment. I think the, uh, the cosmic rays, the momentary, momentary equation looks like the stereoscopic balance of time on the flow. Uh, for example, if you would let your face a uh, magnetic field is uh, periodic. It, it, uh, it kind of does, doesn't it? Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. I don't know if that leads to anything, but keep that thought in mind. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm wondering for the uh, velocity of the gas species, do we have the, something like the Russian three? Okay. Nope, we don't have, in general, we won't because, so um, incompressibility, you know, as you know, it's a good assumption for very subsonic flows, but actually astrophysical flows are often quite supersonic. So we definitely have to keep compressibility in there. <laughs> 